Our church is a light in the darkness, a city on a hill. Every believer is called to make a difference in the world, to love God completely, and to make disciples of every nation. But in this busy, mobile, noisy world, it can be difficult to even do the basics, to pray, to read the Word, to bring the love of God to our marriages, families, neighbors, and co-workers. We know you're here because you want to be a part of God's mission on the earth. You want to experience the abundant life that Scripture talks about. You're looking to connect your faith to every part of your life, every day of the week. That's why our church is subscribing to Right Now Media and making it available for free to every member of our church. You'll have access to over 10,000 online Bible study videos on parenting, marriage, finance, discipleship, leadership, and many more. The videos can be used in Bible study groups or for personal devotion. There's also a huge library of safe biblical kids videos. We'd love to see every member of our church utilizing Right Now Media. Small group leaders leading their adult or youth groups through engaging Bible study series. Children enjoying safe programming that doesn't just entertain, but helps lay a strong spiritual foundation. Families spending quality time together, going through devotional Bible studies. Couples using biblical studies on marriage, parenting, and finance. Applying God's Word to every area of their lives. There is something for everyone. We want to help you grow as a disciple of Christ, and we want to help you become a disciple maker in your home, your school, your workplace, your neighborhood, in whatever mission field God has called you to. We believe that this free resource will help equip and unleash you to live out your faith in every area of life, to experience God-centered, abundant life, not just on Sundays, but every day. We are for you, and God is for you. He wants to empower you every day to live for Him. Together, we can be a light in the darkness, a city on a hill. Hi, I'm Tommy. And I'm Eddie. And we're the Skit Guys. We want to encourage you to sign up for community groups. Uh, I think he means Sunday school classes. Well, some may call them that, but they're really just small groups that meet. That is true, mm -hmm. that is true. Mm -hmm. I heard of a church one time that called them life groups. Oh, oh, um, I have a friend that calls them connect groups. Well, my aunt's church actually calls them cell groups. Okay, okay, my, my brother's cousin, once removed, no, no, twice removed, he calls them growth groups. Well, I heard that the guy who invented toaster strudel, his church calls them family groups. Oh yeah, well, I was watching YouTube once, and this, um, this dachshund was barking, and the dog that was barking made the sound, and the sound that it made sounded like the dog was saying home groups. No. Yes. No. Yes. Show me. Tr what? Show me what it was like. Um, the dog, okay, it was like, home groups, home. Anyway, no matter what you call it, sign up. Yeah, there's nothing better than being a part of community and doing life together at church. How many churches call these groups food groups? I don't know, but if I was in a food group, I'd want to be in chocolate. It's not a food group. Yeah, and these aren't all Sunday school classes. It all starts with the first step, and then another, and then another. But it can be scary sometimes, looking down, looking up, getting distracted, getting confused, sometimes getting lost, getting lost in the moment, celebrating down when we should be climbing up. Sometimes you gotta jump. Sometimes you have to put in some hard work. Sometimes it takes perseverance. Sometimes it takes a blind step of faith. We want to invite you to spend a couple hours with us, have some food, learn what we're about, and let us help you connect more with God and others. No matter where you are with God, no matter where you go, you can attend First Step at any campus or any time that fits your schedule. All you have to do is sign up. But it all starts with a first step.
One, two, check, one, two. Good to see you. Welcome, everybody. If you're a guest, really glad that you're here. If you're online watching, glad that you could join us. If you would, share the live stream, and we hope that we will be able to see you very soon in person. You know, it is, uh, it, 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 it's one of those times where, like, I, the older I get, I'm trying to figure out things to do this summer. What can I, what's something new and exciting I can try? And I feel like, ah, I've been there, done that, right? Kids say, oh, you're so boring, you don't do anything. I'm like, no, I already, I already did it, right? The thrill is gone. It's just, you know, same old, same old. Well, I'm looking for something fresh, something new. And that's what we're going to talk about today and a little bit here about the difference between the old and the new. God's got something new for us, something better for us. And it's something that Jesus brought. And we want you to experience that too. But before we get into that, go ahead and connect with us on your connection card. Do that online, click the link on here, you can do the screens, you can scan your uh, phone, your camera over that code, you can always log on to wifi.southpointccc.com, or you can pick up a card at the door on your way in and way out, and if you are brand new here, we would love to uh, greet you, to meet you, to give you a gift for being here today on your way out, go to the point by the main doors, and we're going to donate five dollars to the Penrickton Center for Blind Children that helps families with multi-disabled children if you're filling out your card for the very first time. Just another way to, to bless the community. And we do like to do things for free. We like free stuff, right? Today is 7-Eleven Day. You know what that is, right? When you go to 7-Eleven, get your free Slurpee, right? Uh, it's always a big day. People will spend all kinds of money and then put out time and effort to go pick up a little bitty cup of artificially flavored ice, right? Because it's free. And I have some experience with that, not only 7-Eleven. But in college, I worked at Dairy Queen, so I would make the Slurpees, right? And sampled all the flavors, and eat. after that, I worked, believe it or not, at the Slush Puppy Factory. You know, familiar with Slush Puppy? Okay, at Cincinnati, I was the guy that was unloading the truck and the boxes and all the jugs and working the line, putting the filled jugs into the boxes and wrapping the pallets and driving the high-low, which was pretty fun. But the funnest thing was dressing up as a Slush Puppy mascot dog and taking kids around, you know, touring them the factory and giving them free stuff and I got to sample every kind of flavor you can ever imagine there and I say all that because we like free stuff right and uh, what we do for you uh, if you're a guest here we don't ask you to give anything we don't want anything from you we want something for you but those who call this our church home we give weekly we give regularly so that we can offer this experience to people freely not just once a year but every week so that your cup would overflow <laughs> Not a little bitty one, but yeah, all kinds of blessings from God, especially the free gift of eternal life that comes through Jesus. And we hope that you'll experience that today as well. So we'll remind you, if you're giving, you can give anytime online on our website. You can always mail it in, or you can give in the boxes at the back of the auditorium on the walls there. Because Jesus said, freely you have received, so freely give. Now we're going to go ahead and pray right now. Uh, before we get into the message and before we, we have an, another song of worship, I want to make sure that we lift up our brother, Juan Pardo. He's one of our elders here. And if you get my Friday email, you've already been updated on this. If you don't get it, sign up on our website. Make sure you get updated. So I'll give you the brief version. You know, Juan recovered from cancer, chemo treatments a while back, but it returned. So he recently had surgery, had to end up having 90% of his tongue removed, and Turns out they just discovered that the, they say the cancer is incurable and it's aggressive. So he's going to have to have even more chemo treatments. So we are agreeing together to pray for Juan's healing because the doctors don't have the final word. And we are going to appeal to God for a reversal 
of that prognosis and ask for his healing, as well as for anybody else that needs that. All right, so let's do that. Father, we join together in the name of Jesus to pray for Juan, that you would help he and Stacy through this very difficult time of struggles and emotional roller coasters, God. And we, we know that you never promised if we have faith in Christ that we'll be spared from the troubles and, and uh, hard times of this world, God, but that you would strengthen us for them. And we pray that for, for uh, Juan and Stacy that you would let them know of your presence and your comfort and your peace and give them that perseverance they need. I pray for anybody else who's struggling with health issues, with a, a emotional, spiritual issues of any kind, God, that they would be whole, healed, uh, happy in their home lives, God. Anything that's coming against us, we pray against it in Jesus' name and that we would experience the life that is abundant in Jesus. So we pray all that through him. Amen. Amen. So let's stand. Let's sing another song of praise. Let this be our response. What an amazing God we serve that at the mention of his name, our enemies will run, they'll flee, they scatter. What an awesome God. There is a name that breaks all chains. There is a name above all names. So I will not fear, no, I won't be afraid. You are the one who's strong to I ran from you and still you came. So I rest secure in your amazing grace. Come on and sing this out with me in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus will be my fortress. No power on earth could ever stand. I fear no evil, I will take courage, for all of creation has to bow before you. Yeah. When I am fighting through the night, you are the dawn.
right. I fear I will <laughs> for all of creation has to bow before him. Hallelujah. We love you guys. And you guys can be I talked about the difference between the old and the new. There's always an ongoing debate about which is better, the old or the new. Like appliances, cars. I mean, are you one of the ones that, oh man, they, they just don't make them like that anymore. Or do you prefer all the upgrades and the new looks of today? How about, you know, houses? you prefer an old style house or one of the new houses? Styles of clothing, old fashioned, new fashion. How about old time rock and roll or modern Whatever that is, right? <laughs> Can I tip my hand on that one? Um, movies, the old movies, the old uh, uh, TV shows, the, the classics, the old cartoons, or all the new stuff, man. The, what do you think? The, the simple life before all the cell phones and social media and endless entertainment options? Or do you prefer all the technology today? Well, again, the debate is endless, and it's very subjective. Um, there's, there's definitely no right or wrong necessarily on those things. But what I fear is sometimes we will hold on to the old at the expense of, of the new, which might offer something really great. It might be something life-changing. I mean, I think about phones back in the day, right? Like, who needs, who needs to carry around a phone? But eventually, you know, I got a BlackBerry, you know, and you, you know. It works. Who needs? No, you got to have an iPhone. Who needs an iPhone? Nobody needs to have. What you, it's too much stuff. And now it's like I have anxiety if I don't have my iPhone with me, right? How do I live without my iPhone? I would have missed out on all that, right? So we got to be careful of that. The, these, the, the old and the new can be both good, but one can be better than the other. And I think that's exactly what we're talking about when it comes to what God offers us. Even the Bible is divided into the old and the new, right? The Old Testament, the Old Covenant. The New Testament, the New Covenant. You know, the Old is the one that Moses gave to the Israelites, to the Jewish people. Went up on the mountain, got the Ten Commandments on the stone tablets and all the other laws, brought them down to the people. It was good, but Jesus came along and said, I got something better that will fulfill the Old and, and take you to a new place. It's all, the, the whole Bible, Old and New, is all God's Word. It's all valuable. It's all true. But the new is better than the old. It's way more relevant and practical for us than the old. The old wasn't bad. It's just not what we needed. It didn't fail us. We failed it because we couldn't do what it said to do. So getting back into 2 Corinthians in our series, On the Right Track, let's get on uh, chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, where Paul says this, Now, if the ministry of death, which is the old, carved in those letters of stone on the Ten Commandment tablets, if they came with such glory, it's good, that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit, the new, have even more glory? So what you need to do really is read along aside this Exodus 34, where Moses does go up on the mountain. He's with God in his presence. He gets the law. When he comes down the mountain, he doesn't realize it. But the people see his face literally glowing from being in God's presence. In fact, here's what he, Exodus 34 says. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. Ever had a glowing face like that? Maybe you've fallen in love. Oh, what's something? It's, you, look, you look so wonderful. You look different. What happened? Well, I'm in love. You're a pregnant woman. you got that glow. Or you see that new menu item at Taco Bell. You know... Some people, you can just tell they're Christians. Can't you? Just by the kind of glow. It shows. But this was a scary kind of glow. The people didn't want to see this, and they asked Moses, you've got to put a veil on to cover that up. Why? Think about Jesus later on the Mount of Transfiguration. You know the story where, boom, you know, 
he starts not just glowing, but shining bright. It says his face shone like the sun. Dazzling brightness. His clothes were gleaming whiteness, so much so that no launderer could get them that white. So it's that kind of glow, that brightness that becomes a glimpse of glory. What's his glory? It's, his, it's God's inner character revealed. It's, it's his brilliance and his majesty and his magnificence. His holiness displayed. And displayed also in what he's done for us. He gets all the praise, all the credit, all the honor for what he's done for us. And it makes you want to shout glory. You know, back in the old day, talking about old school, glory. You know, in response to that kind of thing. And the, the thing is, he's saying, look, the old covenant, the old agreement God had with the Jewish people, uh, it, it had its glory too. Because it displayed God's righteousness. It was a good thing. But this new ministry, that was a ministry of death, which by the way would be a great name for a metal band. Ministry of death. Jesus brings the ministry of the Spirit, this new covenant that has increasing glory. So if that old one had glory, think how much more glory this new one has. How did the old one bring death? Because the terms were not favorable toward us. I mean, the terms were, keep all the commandments and you live. Great. Break a commandment, you die. And we're lawbreakers, so that's death for us. You know, that's, it, it never showed how good we were. It ended up showing how bad we were. It shows how much we need a Savior. So how does this all impact you? Let me give you a few ways. Here's what the new covenant does for you. First of all, it brings life. The old one brought death. The old covenant that, that had its glory, it's gone. The glory has departed. It went away at the cross. It was surpassed through the death and resurrection of Jesus because His life brought us life. It brought us forgiveness. You ever had somebody who just was always pointing out what's wrong with you? Like you can never do anything right. Did that bring life to you? No, it, it brought death to you or made you want to bring death to them. Like, shut up. I already know. And some people will say, well, I can't go to church. You invite them, but oh, if I go there, the, the roof's going to cave in. Why? Because they think I'm so bad, I'm so sinful, that God's out to get me. Right? God's not out to bring you death. He wants to spare you from death. That's why He sent His Son, to bring you life. But first, you do have to understand you deserve death. By what we've done. Our rejection, our rebellion against God. And, and some will say, well, you, you don't have to get up here and tell, tell us we're sinners. People don't need to be told they're sinners. They already know they're sinners. That's why. No, they don't. People don't understand the implications of their sin. That they're not going to experience life. That they're only going to experience death and separation from God. In order to appreciate the good news, news, the glory of the news, you've got to understand the implications of the bad news. To appreciate the amazing grace, you've got to understand the death that you do deserve. But the ministry of the Spirit doesn't just bring us life, it also brings us righteousness. What's righteousness? Well, again, it's that God's majesty, it's His holiness, it's His moral purity. It's His rightness. He's right in everything He does. And we are not. We're not right. That's why we stand condemned before God without hope. And Jesus comes and He lives that righteous life, that perfect life of obedience that we could not. He does for us what we could not do for ourselves. When He dies on the cross, all of our sins are accounted to Him and all of His righteousness is accounted to us so that when God looks at you and me, He no longer sees our sin, He sees His Son's righteousness covering us. Going on in verses 9-11, to 11, For if there was glory in that ministry of condemnation, well, the ministry of righteousness was far exceeded in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, well, how much more will what is permanent have glory? So the new covenant brings life. It brings righteousness, not condemnation. That makes us want to shout glory. Glorify God for that. See, pa pastor and author Warren Wiersbe says the law, the Old Covenant, 
acts like a mirror, right? You can walk around all day with your face dirty and not realize it until you look in the mirror. And that's what the law does. It shows you how dirty you are, how, how fallen and corrupt you are, right? But the mirror cannot cleanse your face. You can, you can even try to wipe off the mirror and you're still dirty. It takes Jesus coming along to actually cleanse your face. To, to, to wipe out your sin through His death and resurrection. And that's, that's really something that the Old Covenant could not do. It couldn't make you right with God. It could just show you how wrong you were. And really, all the other religions of the world, all the worldviews out there, will simply tell you, you know what? You've got to do more. You've got to try harder. You've got to earn it. You've got to deserve it. Pray, pay, meditate, work, 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 and then maybe, maybe, you'll be right with God. And man, that's just a dead end. It's never going to happen. We've got to make sure that we are receiving this gift of life that only Jesus offers. The one thing that no other religion can offer is that grace, that, that gift. Because if you keep trying harder, do this, do more, you're continually going to be in frustration you're going to be in desperation. You're going to be in hopelessness because being good will never, ever be good enough. Author Paul Little describes it like this. Uh, I like the idea of, a, of trying to swim to Hawaii. Imagine everybody lining up on the shore of California, and we're all going to swim to Hawaii. And a few people will be able to swim 10 feet. Others will be able to swim 10 miles. But guess what? We're all going to drown. We're all going to die if we try to make it to Hawaii on our own. But imagine... A cruise ship comes along, and the captain shouts out, Hey, everybody, get on board. I'll give you a free trip to Hawaii. And the ones who humble themselves and get on board, sit back, relax, and enjoy that free trip. You know who are going to be the ones most reluctant to get on board? Are the best swimmers. Because they're going to think they're superior to everybody. I'll, I'll show you. I'm going to make it on my own. Jesus comes along and says, Hey, everybody, you ain't going to make it to heaven on your own. Why don't you get on board with me? I'll give you a free trip to heaven. I already paid for it. You just relax and enjoy it. And you know the people most reluctant to get on board with Jesus are the good, moral people. Because they, they want to think they can do it on their own. They want to prove that they're good enough. That they deserve it. They're worthy. And so they won't humble themselves to receive the gift. They won't humble themselves to get into the baptistry. And they're going to miss out. And if you're trying to live that way, you're not going to have any confidence before God because you're always going to be frustrated and failing and falling because you'll never be quite good enough. You're not going to make it on your own. And the sad truth is, there are even some who are Christians who have accepted Christ and they still live that way. They, they, they don't really feel spiritual unless they beat themselves up over everything. And they, they carry these heavy burdens that sometimes Christians and ministers and churches will put on them unnecessarily. Unless you do this and do that and do more and try harder, you're not going to make it. No. In Christ, you are one of His righteous ones. You have been declared right. You're covered. You're one of His saints. And something else that Jesus offers that no other religion, no worldview can offer is that actual help to live for God, to live righteously. Because just keep telling people, don't do this, don't do that, do this. That's not going to stop anybody. That's not going to prevent them from doing it. Jesus brings a new way with a new power to become righteous. He actually transforms us. Like Jesus was transfigured, we get transfigured on the inside and we begin to glow with His brightness shining out from us. That's why maybe the old hymn words it best. When I survey... The wondrous cross, the glorious cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count as loss. Now, love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. That new covenant brings life, it brings righteousness. And Paul points out also it's far superior because it's eternal. The old covenant was temporary, it was passing away, ending. The glory was fading from it. In fact, that whole old system, the sacrificial system in Jerusalem with the temple and the altars and all that, is gone. 
All that was destroyed, you know, soon after Jesus came to earth. And it's never returned, and it never should. We should never go back to the temple, to the sacrificial system and the altars and all that. It's over. It's been fulfilled, set aside. Going to 1 Corinthians, his first letter, he says to them, look, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is what? It's that law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That old covenant, it brought death because we couldn't fulfill it. But the new actually defeats the enemy of death. It puts us right with God, and that means we don't have to wait for anything to come back. The old to return, the temple, the sacrifice. All we're waiting for is Jesus to come back. And back in the day, when people talked about the second coming of Christ, we would shout, glory. It's a glorious day when he returns. And that's why Christian funerals are so different. Because we're not just mourning, we're celebrating that this person has entered in to the glory of the Lord. We have that hope of eternal glory. And I think a good place right now to stop and respond to that would be to share in the Lord's Supper. Because when we eat the unleavened bread and drink the fruit of the vine, it reminds us not only of his death, of mourning, of sadness, but it's a celebration of his life that he rose from the dead. He's coming back. If you don't yet have a relationship with Christ, I would urge you to take these next few moments of quiet to reflect, to consider what I'm talking about, and maybe even to make the best decision of your life and to put your trust in Jesus, to stop trusting in yourself, trying to earn it to be worthy, and throw yourself completely on the mercy of Christ. Turn from your sin, be baptized into Him. And if you would like to make that decision today, would you let us help you do that? Text your name to the number on the screen or email us, or if you're here on site, meet us up here at the front after the service. We would love to pray with you, to answer your questions, or to help you get ready for your own baptism this very day to be cleansed of your sins and filled with His Spirit. But on that night before Jesus was crucified, He met with His disciples for that last supper. And He said to them in Luke 22, when He gathered some bread, He gave thanks, He broke it, He gave it to them, and He said, this is My body which is being given for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. And in the same way, He took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is what? The new covenant. In my blood. That's what we celebrate every week. We're under the new covenant. And that's what we celebrate as we share in communion. So let's pray. Father, as we get ready to share in this simple meal, we want to thank you for sending Jesus to cover us with your righteousness, to put us in a right standing with you. God, thank you for that increasing glory in our lives. And we're waiting for the day that we experience it fully when Jesus returns. Help us to shine, to keep glowing from within because Jesus is in our lives. We pray that in his name. Amen. So let's take communion and I'll come back to share the rest of this passage. All right, so the New Covenant brings life, brings righteousness, it's eternal. 
Paul's next sentence is this in, in verses 12 and 13. Since we have such a hope, we're very bold. Not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. So, to understand this, Moses goes up on the mountain. He's in the presence of God. Comes down. His face is glowing. But it was temporary. The glory began to fade away. But in order to give the impression that he was still glowing, he kept the veil over his face. He kept you know, a mask up, a pretense. It was fake. Our glory is from within, right? We don't have to go up to the mountain to be in the glory of the Lord. Why? Because the Lord has come to live in us. The glory is internal and it's intensifying. That was fading, but ours is growing stronger. We don't need to fake it. We have this glory that is an eternal hope because of Jesus' death and resurrection. We know that we're going to live forever. Let me give you an illustration from video games. All right, let's talk old school video games, new school video games, right? I'm, I'm all for the old school video games. The new ones make me nauseous, right? It's just all these buttons and you're constantly moving around and everything. Who's with me? Atari. One joystick, right? One button, all right? I stopped playing video games once I got up to about PS2 and my five-year-old is beating me on all the games and I'm just losing my mind, right? So I said, that's not healthy for me anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm done with the video games. But I'll tell you, there's a big difference in playing video games when old school, you know you only had one life. Or maybe three at the most. So you would play very safely, very cautiously. Because once you're dead, you're dead. Unless you had cheat codes, right? If you, if you bought cheat codes, which were like 50 numbers and letters long, entered that in, you could live more. But today, you can have unlimited lives. You can keep respawning and respawning, and you can just go for it. You're all in on that game because it doesn't matter if you die. That's the difference in the way you live your life as a Christian. You don't have to be safe and cautious. You can live boldly. You can love boldly. I mean, what are they going to do? We're going to live forever. You can read God's Word and claim its promises boldly. You can go out there and share your faith with others boldly. I mean, this, this, is, this is an awesome thing that we get to experience. That's why the big idea is let go of the old to live bold. You've got to let go of the old if you want to live bold. But we can, we can play the game Moses played. We can keep trying to fake it. We can try to pretend like we, we're glowing, man, but we got that veil over us. We're not living boldly. We're not, we're not going all in for God. We're kind of leaving Him in the background, in the dust. We're neglecting Him, ignoring Him. We're living selfishly. We're, we're living sinfully. So where are you at with God right now? Are, are you spending any time with Him at all? Are you, are you getting close to Him? Getting into His presence? I mean, don't, you don't have to go up to a mountaintop. Don't wait for some mountaintop spiritual experience to draw close to God. He's in you. He's with you right now. You can enter into His presence any day. You know, Moses was up there for 40 days. So I would encourage you, challenge you, why not take the next 40 days to spend some time with God in a daily encounter of reading His Word or listening to His Word, praying, getting close to God again, rekindling that, that spark, that glow again. Let the glory begin to shine through you again. You know, others, though, remain va veiled. They, they got the veil on because they don't believe at all. Going on in verses 14 and 16, but their minds were hardened, the ones who are under the old. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. So those who reject Christ... They, they don't see His glory. Their minds are clouded. It's not that they're not smart or they're not educated. It's just that they, they miss the truth. They lose perspective. To this day, when the Hebrew Scriptures are read in Jewish synagogues across the world, there's a veil that keeps them in the dark. That keeps them trapped in this old system where they, they're trying harder and doing more and trying to earn their way through works and they don't understand it. They won't let go of the old in order to embrace this new way of faith in Jesus. I, I, it's hard for us to understand, but 
Maybe it's because at first, they just don't understand. They, they don't get it. We, we understand that. But at some point, they begin to harden themselves against the truth. Harden their minds, harden their hearts against Jesus. And we see that going on all over the place in our culture today. Look around at society and the way it's become hardened against God's truth. I mean, it's unbelievable the, the things that are going on. It's like there's a veil over this culture where, where they reject God's teaching. They reject what's true and right and good. And the farther away we drift from God, the more foolish and ridiculous it gets. It's like people are losing their minds. They, they have no common sense anymore. Up is down. Right is wrong. It's like we're living on different planets. Those who believe in God's Word and those who don't, we don't even begin to understand. We're not even talking the same language anymore. We don't share any of the same values anymore. What has happened? Now, we're being gaslighted by the society to make us think we're the ones that don't understand. That we're the ones who are wrong. We're the ones who are, are bad and on the wrong side of history. It makes you want to feel so angry toward people like that. But don't be. Don't be angry. Really, you need to pity them because that's the way we all are until we embrace Christ and the veil is lifted and the fog clears out and your eyes are open and your heart begins to soften and you begin to say, wow, I never saw it this way before. That's something only the Lord can do for us. What's more troubling to me is how many Christians are turning their back on the truth. Are, they, they've experienced the glory of the new, but they keep going back to the old ways. To the old systems. They should know better. They get off the right track. And they begin to live for the temporary things of this world. They glory in the, in the empty uh, values and goals of this world, the temporary pleasures and, and thrills, the empty promises of this world, they trade it all in for the old when there's something better. Don't hold on to the old because it just seems more natural or familiar or comfortable. That's a life of death. The life Jesus brings is one of newness. Everything is new. Right? New birth. New creation, new community, a new way, new wineskins, a new heavens, a new earth. Why in the world would you want to go back to the old? Everything is new and improved. Verses 17 and 18 say, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So from glory to glory, increasing, surpassing, to become more and more like Jesus. That's the life we live. That's because the new covenant brings the Spirit. The Lord is the Spirit. God is one person, or one being in three persons. Three in one trinity. The Spirit is not just some force or some energy within you. It is God Himself coming to dwell in you. In the old, you had to go somewhere to meet with God. You go up to the mountain. You go to the tabernacle. You go to the temple. Now, God comes to us. His dwelling is in us. And again, that's something that nothing else in the world can offer. No other religion or worldview offers the presence and power of the Spirit. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 6 says, do you not know, everybody say this out loud together with me, do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? You're His temple. He's in you. That means you've got the power to, to be like Jesus. To grow spiritually. To obey God. You have a whole different motivation. A new power. You have a, a new strength to do that. Moses, all he could do was, which was pretty cool, granted, he, all he could do was radiate glory that was reflecting from God. We've got the glory within us. It's, it's radiating from within us. We received the Holy Spirit when we gave our lives to Christ, when we were born of water and the Spirit in baptism, when we were washed in the water of baptism, the renewing of the Holy Spirit, the very power that raised Jesus from the dead came to live in us and raised us up from the dead too. So 
We've got all this power, all this life, and so why are we walking around so lifeless, so full of stress, so unable to cope when there's something glowing within us? This power, this, this purpose. We've got so much more access to God than Moses ever did. And yet we keep trying to do life apart from God on our own, which just leaves us feeling more frustrated and failing and falling. We've got to submit ourselves to His leadership so that He can transform us, our character, that He can overcome these sinful desires we have, so that He can drive out these demons that are troubling us and purify our motives and make us bold to serve and to influence and to witness. Because the final feature that Paul points out is the new covenant brings freedom. Before Christ, we are slaves to those sinful desires. We are in bondage to our addictions and our our inclinations and tendencies and propensities and proclivities. I mean, we can't stop doing these things. No matter how hard we try, but Jesus sets us free. He does for us what we could not do for ourselves. He gives us forgiveness and the power to change. We don't have to to stay where we are. We don't have to listen anymore to those who say, do this, do that, do more, try harder. We're free from all that. You ever have to deal with people where you tell them the same thing over and over and over and they just don't get it? Maybe you had your parents or you have an older relative. It's like, you have to keep telling them, here's how you unlock your phone. You know, here's how you send an email. Don't click on something that's going to give you a virus, right? Over and over. Or you have a 13-year-old and you have to keep telling them over and over, here's how you sweep the floor. Here's how you use a broom. Here's how you get out the vacuum. Don't just sweep around your feet the whole floor and don't leave piles of dirt. And here's how you put the broom back and here's how you, you know, wrap up the cord and put the vacuum. Over and over, you have to keep telling them. Or you know, you're a business owner, you're a supervisor, and you have to keep telling your employees over and over how to do their stinking job. You go into the restroom at, at some place of business or restaurant, and what's on the... The wall, there's a sign that says employees must wash their hands. Really? Seriously? You need a rule for that? It's more than a rule. It's the law. That sign has to be posted there. Folks, the more you grow in Christ, the more you realize, I don't need laws. Some people need laws. Lawbreakers need laws. They need rules. Because they either don't know, or they don't care, or they're just too immature. You have to Tell them over and over and over and over again. But the more you mature in Christ, the less you need all those rules. Because you got a new power within you. you got a new heart. You want to love God. You want to love your neighbor as yourself. You, You don't need all the extra rules. You've got something better. You've got the new covenant. And we don't obey the New Testament in order to get saved. You know what? We obey it because we are saved. Because we want to. And we can. Let go of the old to live bold. I saw a young person the other day with a t-shirt that said, you are enough. Ah, yeah. You are enough. And I wanted to say, no, you're not. You are not enough. I am not enough. That's why you need a Savior. He's enough. So that's the end of this section of 2 Corinthians 1-3. through I hope you're going to come back next week as we start a new section, chapters 4-7, through which we're calling Represent. It's about staying tough uh, through tough times. Staying true in tough times. And we're going to start with this first message, Don't Lose Heart. And I'll bet you probably know somebody who needs to be here for that. So let's stand and let's sing as a response.
and break every chain of God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, I sing your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You have done great things. Oh, God. does great things in our lives. We just love you, God, for all the many blessings you've given us. And let's continue our time of worship as we know that God has every battle, every victory in our lives.
joining us. We'll see you back here next week in the South Point. Have a blessed week.